I'm Alex Weiser, YIVO's Public Programs Director, and I'm here with Neil W. Levin, YIVO's Anne E. Leibovitz Visiting Professor in Residence in Music, and we're here talking about Yiddish folk song as a part of our continuing evolution, Yiddish Folk Song Today Festival. Neil, tell me about Yiddish folk song. We were just talking about folk song in general, um, but what characterizes Yiddish folk song in particular? Well, of course, what comes first, the Yiddish language or the Jewish context uh, as the overall umbrella. Um, you could have one without the other, but not the other without one. Um, which is to say that Yiddish is one of the major Jewish languages. It annoys me very much. Well, a lot of things annoy me, so it doesn't matter. But uh, it annoys me very much uh, that certain universities think they're being highfalutin to put Yiddish into the Germanic languages department when it belongs in the Jewish studies department. Because of course, uh, a large component of Yiddish is 12th century, 12th century German, Middle High German. But it's also uh, an important part of it is Hebrew, equally important part of Hebrew. And then depending upon where, uh, uh, some degree of Slavic uh, words in different uh, regional Yiddishes. But uh, it is a Jewish language in the way that Hebrew is a Jewish language, in the way that Ladino uh, or Judeo Espanol wouldn't be part of the Spanish department, but it's part of Jewish studies, it's a Jewish language. Um, and it's, it's not just the, voca the words, the vocabulary, but it's, it's the expressions, the meaning, the sensitivities, the sensibilities. Uh, and at one time, um, as late as the 1890s or even the turn of the century, scholars differ on the exact percentage, but it is estimated by some scholars that 95% of world Jewry spoke Yiddish as their primary primary spoken language, whether or not they also were learning English as immigrants in America, or whether or not they also knew German because their parents wanted them in, in certain circles to, to learn German separately from Yiddish, or Polish if they lived in Poland, but their primary spoken language is Yiddish. And uh, to a lot of people that seems awfully high until you look at the numbers. I remember some, uh, even when I first heard that, when I was just in high school or something again, maybe at, at university in the first few years. And, and I said, well, wait a minute, what about the Yemenite Jews? Yeah, well, how many Yemenite Jews? I mean, it's because of the rom romantic story of the, uh, the magic carpet, I mean, the, the uh, 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 rescuing and bring, bringing many Yemenites to the new state of Israel, and then the interest in the exotic, what, what to us as Westerners is exotic, but the numbers are small. But the numbers of, Ger of, of German Jews at, at its height is small. I don't, I, I mean, it's like 600,000 maybe at peak. But we're talking millions and millions and millions of, of, of uh, Jews so, uh, in, in the late 1890s. And those who'd come to America, even if they were learning English, the majority still spoke Yiddish as their first language at home among themselves and so forth. So uh, uh, Yiddish is, 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 is one of the major Jewish languages and therefore um, it has a rich history as one would expect of folk song of its language of Yiddish. Um, the interesting thing is, as I pointed out in, in one of the essays um, that I wrote in that uh, book that you have, is that as late as around 1860 in Russia, in St. Petersburg, which was the capital of the Russian, not only of Russia, but of the Russian empire, uh, a Jewish ethnographer by the name of Moshe Berlin was asked to give a report uh, on sociological circumstances and so forth of, of Russian empire Jewry uh, for various purposes on 
how to deal with things, legislation, rulings, uh, uh, where people could live, whatever the reasons. And he made the astounding statement that as far as he knew, the Jews of the Russian empire, which meant not Russia per se, because of, there were very few Jews allowed to live in the country of Russia per se, and those who did were uh, uh, middle class, upper middle class, uh, professional classes, uh, universities, so forth. So, forth. so the, where was the folk? In the Ukraine, in Belarusia, um, which were part of the Pale of Settlement. Not every part of it, but much of the Pale of Settlement included that. Russian Poland, which was technically not part of the Pale because it had its own rules and regulations for its Jewry, but was part of the Russian Empire. The Tsar of all the Russias was also the Tsar or the King of Russian Poland until the uh, until the uh, Second Revolution in February of 1917. Uh, he made the Moshe Berlin made the astounding statement that the Jews of that entire region, the entire empire, had no secular folk song of their own. Now, oh, what did that mean? It meant the only singing they did was in synagogue or at home around the, the Shabbos table, uh, but, uh, but that's religious song, in other words. But they had no secular folk song. Nobody knows if he assumed everyone has to sing. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there were no computers to play with. Uh, there were no record players uh, and um, radio or anything like that. People sang. So either he just meant that, uh, well, then if they were in the Ukraine, they sang Ukrainian folk songs, which they probably did too. But of course, as we know now, there was, there were, tens of thousands of Yiddish folk songs living in, in those cultures. Um, well, okay, it has been uh, theorized that he probably knew better, but not necessarily so. Um, but that he probably knew better, or if he knew better, he was trying to make a point for political purposes uh, for the benefit of Jewry, to show that the Jews were had risen above folk singing <laughs> and that they were not uh, an ethnic group uh, as much as they were a religion and therefore could be a, uh, uh, an alternative religion within the Russian Empire. Uh, there was a socio-political uh, uh, motivation uh, for that. Um, it's not certain. I mean, it, it makes some sense. It could be, it could be that as well as uh, ignorance. Yeah. The ignorance is kind of understandable too, uh, because um, the urbanized middle or upper middle class Jewry, if they were removed two generations, let's say, from the pale, could possibly have known nothing uh, of what went on. Uh, just imagine today, it's very hard to do this, but just imagine today, if you're in New York, electricity has not been discovered yet. So there, and, and there, there's no reason for you to travel by stagecoach to Kentucky. Um, it is possible that if you heard um, somebody came from Kentucky to New York and sang you, or, or anywhere from Appalachia or from Smoky Mountains, their folk song, that it would become as the most weird, exotic revelation. If you, if you imagine all of the uh, elements that go into that scenario that I'm painting, it is definitely possible. Uh, so in a way, that's sort of the way things were. But what's more astounding is that the famous um, Jewish historian, Simon Dubnov, who had developed a, an appreciation for the ethnicity of Jewry rather than as, as what uh, uh, another um, uh, Gratz, uh, uh, another historian, his name was Gratz, uh, spoke of Russian Empire Jewry or Jewry in general as a spiritual uh, community as a spiritual um, 
uh, group. Uh, 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 Dubnov was already willing to address the ethnicity, the ethnic, the secular ethnic aspect just as well. And yet, as late as 1890, even not 1860, but now 1890, maybe just a little after that, uh, Simon Dubnov said the same thing. He said the Jews of the Russian Empire uh, don't have any secular folk song of their own. In other words, no, there's no such thing. It's as if to say there is no such thing as Yiddish folk song. Now, it's true, he was speaking about the Russian Empire, and uh, there is, uh, he didn't specifically say, as far as I know, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which would have included Galicia, which is roughly, roughly speaking, the other half of what is today Poland. But I, I think it's obvious that that was included, and, and Romania is not included, and Hungary is not included. But uh, I, I, I think that the general notion was that there is no such thing as a secular Jewish folk song, because the Jews living in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, in the 1890s, who were lawyers, accountants, professors, uh, engineers, uh, uh, academics, um, or the few clergymen, rabbis, cantors, so forth, uh, really uh, had no, no, no way of knowing until uh, at, towards the end of the century, two professional people, one an accountant, one a lawyer, actually both had law degrees. Uh, the one practiced law, the other was an accountant, and they were both very uh, much historians uh, as well. Uh, Merrick and Ginsburg uh, decided to take the bull by the horns, as it were, and uh, put notices uh, in Russian Jewish periodicals, uh, both uh, Russian language and uh, Hebrew language, which meant that there were, th this was already a Zionist, but not necessarily a politically Zionist, a culturally Zionist dash Haskalah, Enlightenment uh, 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 exercise, and see what people in the pale could send them in the way of what exists in Yiddish folk songs. And the result was astounding. Uh, eight people even notated things in music. Unfortunately, it was never published. Only the words were published. Uh, that was for technical reasons and so forth. But, and there, it only included a part of the pale, more, more or less the northern part. That established right away, along with what composer Joel Engel, uh, who was also very much a self-made ethnologist in terms of research in, in, into Yiddish folk song or Hebrew folk song, Yiddish or Hebrew folk song in Russian Empire Jewry, among Russian Empire Jewry. Um, that came as a revelation and that revelation held great interest for many in the non-Jewish Russian uh, 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 intelligentsia uh, in St. Petersburg and Moscow because they were already interested in Russian folk song and folklore. And they accepted that this was uh, a part of that, a subgroup of that. Uh, so uh, where Dubnov came up with that idea because he didn't have any political agenda. Uh, it's not that the government asked uh, for him for a report as was the case with Moshe Berlin, uh, but it was just an assumption. And then of course, uh, uh, by 1912, between 1912-13 up through 1911, actually, up through 19, let's say 13-14, there was the famous Anski expedition. Uh, but again, through only parts of the, of the huge area that was the Pale of Settlement, uh, which uh, brought back actual field recordings. We can actually hear them today, some of them. Uh, I'm very primitive equipment, but we can hear it, of uh, both Hebrew and Yiddish uh, secular folk song, and in their case, religious folk song, Hasidic song as well. Uh, so uh, this was a, a revelation to the world. Now, the, the bigger question, um, just for fun, because it doesn't really alter our appreciation, uh, is the age. How far back does it go? And um, every once in a while, somebody will make a discovery of words uh, of Yiddish folk song words from Western Europe, from German speaking Europe, going back to medieval times. And they'll tell me all about it and say, oh, it existed then. So I have to say, now, wait a minute. First of all, you are now speaking about 
what was called Judeo-German or Western Yiddish is really obsolete uh, from, the, from the Middle Ages. It's not the Yiddish that we know that was brought from uh, German speaking, the Rhineland areas and so forth to Poland and, and so forth and then developed in, in, into the Yiddish we have today. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is you don't know anything about, and we can't know anything about what the music was, what the tunes were. You only have the words. So yes, um, people like to sing. That is something that probably is common to all ethnicities or nations, which means exactly the same thing. Uh, they like to sing. They need to sing. At one time, they needed to sing more than now. Uh, and um, so it's not surprising that there was secular folk song because there was secular poetry, but we have no idea what it sounded like. Uh, I think we can be pretty certain that it did not have any of the modalities uh, that Jews learned first when they migrated or were actually invited to migrate to uh, Poland, even when um, by King Casimir the Great and so forth, um, and heard uh, uh, in Polish song and in, then in Ukrainian song uh, and so forth. Um, uh, and the same thing is probably true of instrumental folk music. Uh, yes, there was instrumental folk music being played, whether it was for weddings or whatever, uh, in medieval Western Europe along the Rhineland and so forth. But it wouldn't have sounded anything uh, like what the Klezmorim played later in Eastern Europe, different modalities and so forth. So the how far back it is possible, it is just possible that Yiddish folk song in the Russian Empire or in Eastern Europe, Eastern and East Central Europe to be too exact, uh, it's possible that it doesn't go back further than the 18th century. Late, maybe not even the late 18th century, in terms of the of, of the music part of the tune part, uh, but um, you know, 125 years is sufficient to establish uh, many traditions. Um, I mean, we're going to be talking about a Yiddish uh, folk song, which is largely a secular folk song because there is also a very important element for another festival next year, maybe, of Hebrew uh, religious folk song, but it's folk song, namely Hasidic song um, for religious purposes, although it's in the context of a mindset that there is no such thing as anything that isn't religious, every enjoyment has a religious aspect to it in, 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 in uh, Hasidic thinking and so forth. So uh, uh, we're talking about secular, but a secular poem or a secular song can still touch upon aspects of religious life, which touched uh, just about all Jewry uh, in East Central Europe until until the Haskalah began to take, take force and until some secularization started to happen. But secularization does not necessarily mean anti-religious. It could, but it doesn't necessarily. I, 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 I always bridle at some of these terms when people talk, so-and-so is a secular Jew. I don't know what that means. Um, I, I wish I had it with me. Next, next time we do lecture, I wanna have Masha Benya's speech that she gave. Uh, at an award that I uh, presented to her uh, in 1997, where she pointed out there is no uh, conflict between secular Jewish life and religious Jewish life, uh, necessarily. And she, she said, in my home, there was no conflict between Yiddish folk song and Beethoven. Those are pretty much her exact words. That's the kind of home she came from in, in Poland. Uh, so, uh, to say it's so-and-so is a secular Jew, a lot of times people mean that that person doesn't even know when Yom Kippur is. This is not so. It means one has an, an added appreciation for secular culture. And 
it could be secular uh, culture outside of secular Jewish culture. None of these are mutually exclusive. So, uh, but until that time, I mean, Jewish communities were ruled by rabbinic authority, the Kahal and so forth. Um, so uh, there is uh, a whole category of Yiddish folk song that refers to religious things, whether it's uh, lighting the Shabbos candles, whether it's aspects of Jewish education, whether it's a song called uh, I don't want to go to Hebrew school. <laughs> uh, it was a very popular song at one time. Uh, whether it is uh, a folklorized song, and we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, but belongs in a folk song concert. Doesn't have any uh, piano part written to it as an art song by uh, somebody uh, who was very, very famous for writing these kinds of songs, uh, Mordecai de Beertig. Song Rezala which may have many strophes we don't know about yet, even though he, he wrote it. Every once in a while, somebody will come up with a new strophe. Why? Because it's like a variant strophe. At some party, almost like a game, actually as a game, somebody said, let's, I got an idea. Let's, let's, let's add a strophe about this or that. And, it's, and, and then it caught on. And we're finding that all the time. I and mean, that's, that is the subject of research for many, many uh, PhD dissertations, actually. Now, well, uh, in the song Rezala, uh, a young boy who is already influenced by the Haskalah, so he's not so religious, and he has a crush on a, a girl living on the third or fourth or fifth story of a building, I don't remember, uh, whose parents are traditional. And, she, and of course, each strophe is about how her parents aren't crazy about him. First of all, he's what in Yiddish we call prost, common, vulgar. Why? Because he doesn't come up to tell her to come down. To, he whistles up to him. But then it gets to the big thing. He's not religious. Oh, in that song, he says at one of the strophes, you know what? For you, I will even put on tefillin. I'll even become religious and pray every day. Like that. So that's a secular song, but it's tied to Jewish life. And that's an aspect of religious Jewish life. Uh, <coughs> some love song, many love songs surprised people uh, who thought they knew something in St. Petersburg or Moscow or wherever uh, about uh, uh, Yiddish soci Jewish sociology that love, uh, courtly love, romantic love was a non-Jewish superimposition. Well, of course, Yiddish folk songs so that wasn't true at all. But in some of them, there's, there is a religious aspect to it because there's already values are coming into it. Uh, in others, they're just like any other love song. You, you could poke around at the text and you wouldn't find anything terribly different from any other. So uh, Yiddish folk song topics uh, cover a very, very wide um, area of, of, of uh, subject matter topics and so forth. Um, and one can learn a lot about uh, Jewish values uh, and about Jewish history uh, and so forth. I, I think one of the most interesting things about uh, Yiddish folk songs is a thing called parodies. Now, let's talk about that for a while. Now the word parody already is misunderstood in the most cases because for some, um, some reason, the automatic assumption is that the word means something humorous. It can be, and very often is, but it could be the absolute opposite. And also in classical music, it means something altogether different. Uh, most famous thing was parody masses uh, in the medieval Renaissance period. Uh, I mean, there's a connection in the sense that a parody mass, the most famous probably is uh, Palestrina's uh, Mr. Papa Marcelli where the Cantus Firmus is a secular, maybe even a vulgar folk song. But the words aren't there, so it doesn't matter. And the entire structure of the mass is built upon that as a, what we call a Cantus Firmus. Um, but actually, you could go into uh, many of Bach chorales uh, at the end of a cantata, uh, 
were actually taken from very, rather vulgar street songs. Uh, the tune, not the text. Martin Luther did the same thing uh, for, for the Lutheran service. Um, so, but a parody means something very specific in, in the case of Yiddish folk song. It means taking the theme, the broad theme of the, of the text of the song and transferring it to another context that becomes another variation of that theme. So let's talk first about a song uh, that you're going to um, that you're going to be programming on uh, Meyer Commons. So, so this is well. You first of all, you tell us what 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 the, what it means, and then I'll tell you about a variant. So Meyer Kamanzun is a song, a wonderful folk song that Ravel actually has a beautiful setting of, um, in which the 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 father asks the son various questions about uh, about life, and the son very dutifully answers with with these. Um, liturgical quotes uh, in Hebrew. And, and so it's a wonderful kind of bilingual song um, in Yiddish and Hebrew. And the Hebrew, uh, of course, is this kind of Ashkenazi pronunciation. So it's a great little time capsule of how Hebrew was spoken at that time. Okay, so already without, without talking about any parody yet, you are already talking about one variant because other var there are many variants that are not parodies yet, text variants where the conversation is either different or additional to that. So uh, actually this song belongs to several categories. One of them is called a dialogue song category. It's in this case, father and son in, until we get to the parody. But what's it about? In many of the variants, it's about, I would say, if I had to pick a theme, I would say it's about values, Jewish values. Absolutely. It doesn't mean that there aren't other cultures who have the same, don't have the same values, but that's not our concern here. They may not quote the, the they may not quote the Jewish liturgy in order to express those values though, so. <laughs> so that's right. Exactly. Some of the variants don't. In one famous variant, the primary subject of the dialogue is who, the son wants to marry. And he says to his father, such and such a girl. And so the father asks, well, how much is the dowry? Now, one can look at that and say, uh, oh, then they're being materialistic. However, one would be wrong because one has to know that in many, many circles, of Eastern European Jewish life. I would say in most circles at one time, a parent wanted at least one son, and at that time it would have to be a son, who would be learned in Torah, who would be what we call a Talmud Chacham, someone learned, not just superficially, but really learned. Nothing would give a parent greater pride than that, nothing. If a, a, a couple had no sons, they had only daughters, or one of the sons later on, as frankly in, um, in, in my grandparents' case, um, they, they then wanted at least a son-in-law a husband for one of the daughters who would be a Talmud Chacham. So it was very common to look for a, in a situation like that, to look for a family of, of, of the bride who had enough money and could give enough dowry to allow the son not to have to work and study all day, six days a week, in a, well, it wouldn't be a shiva, would be a kolo uh, for married people, whatever, uh, to, to not waste his time earning a living. And that's what that was about. So that's about Jewish values. It was very common. It's also a reason why age didn't matter. It was much more common. Well, now it's become common again. 
But, you know, in the 1950s, and to this day in many, actually in many Jewish uh, um, um, Oriental societies in the Near East and so forth, it's still, if, if, if a woman would be even one year older than the man, that would be taboo. Whereas in Eastern Europe, it was very common uh, for uh, the bride to be six years older. The important thing was that that, she, that her family, if possible, could enable the 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 the, the, husband, the, the groom to um, spend his time becoming a Talmud Chacham. This is very important, and it's, and, it, and this uh, becomes part of many of the songs on on our program, not just Meir Kamenzun. So it's about Jewish values. But then another variant, uh, as Meir, as the father. Um, saying, well, I don't like this wedding. And the son saying something that was, an, that was already new, which is, I don't care whether you like it or not. Yeah? Shades of Shalom Aleichem, a new world. And the father said, well, basically something to the effect of, well, then I won't come to the wedding. And so in that variant, the son says, well, then you won't see your grandchildren. And the way he puts it in the song is, then you won't come to the bris. You won't come to the circumcision. He's, I don't know why he's assuming it's going to be a boy, but whatever. But if the father gets the message and says, all right, tell me when the wedding is. Now, I don't know about you, but I know people even now, uh, Jewish, not Jewish, has nothing to do with it, who have had a disagreement about uh, the, the, whether the one should marry the other. And the threat was, you won't see your grandchildren. You, one hears that now. It's a, it's a story uh, and, as old as time itself. Yeah, and uh, or if that was their attitude, then believe me, that attitude changes the minute the grandchild is born. So, a song like this, Meyer Kamenzon, is teaching us a lot about values and also changing values. And you mentioned Ravel, uh, and you're going to do the Ravel setting of it, among other settings, right? We're doing the Ravel setting, yeah. Well, Ravel made it into what would certainly be performable on an art song program because it's Ravel. And of course he did a brilliant job of making sure that it was very appropriately simple. And you don't, well, maybe you do, I shouldn't say you don't. You know how many people who should know better? I mean, people really have assumed that Ravel was Jewish just because of that song. Added to the fact that some ignoramus published a big hardcover book about called famous Jews of a wandering race, something like that, uh, 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 where he lists Ravel ipso facto as Jewish because of that song, to which I say, well, Ravel, first place, he went to the famous World's Fair in Paris, where he was introduced to all kinds of non-Western European cultures. And he was fascinated by that. He was also fascinated by Chinese culture. So, and he wrote some things with Chinese um, influence on it. So was he Chinese? I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, Ravel did that as an artistic challenge, I would say. And it, I would also say I, I, that it's part of what we call standard repertoire. Um, oh, I, I, we could talk for a long time. We're not going about what standard repertoire means. It means that to an educated person in music, it doesn't come as a surprise. Even if it hasn't been performed for 40 years or, or one doesn't hear it so much as one used to, this concerto, that symphony, but it's not a revelation that it exists. It's standard repertoire. And certainly the, the Ravel setting is. But now let's talk about a parody. One of the most interesting parodies transfers this to the Soviet Union in the 1920s. Now this is a mocking song. It's mocking the, Soviet, the, the communist system. It's mocking the Soviet Union. And there are hundreds of songs like that. And to start with, it, instead of between a father and a son, it's between a mother and a son. That already was, well, we take it for granted, but the very fact of, uh, of, of, of women being railroad engineers or whatever in, in the Soviet Union before the war was already an astonishing notion to anyone in, in Western Europe. So now 
that women are workers. Women are just as important in the communist youth movement and so forth. Just as girls are just as important as boys in the Zionist youth movements and so forth. The Girl Scouts just as important as the Boy Scouts as it were. So here you have a mother and, and he changed the name to Nochemke, Nochem. So Nochemke, the... Um, the diminutive. Yeah, the nickname for... Uh, and Nochemke uh, mein Zun. And he says he's going to marry a certain girl. So his mother says to him, well, what's her dowry? Her nadan, nadan, her nadan, her dowry. And he says, her two golden hands that are capable of working for the working class. And the mother is very happy with that. And the mother asks, well, what are her credentials? Now, in the original, it would have been to America, what is the word they would have used is yichas. What is the yichas, your, your uh, pedigree? So the yichas would have been, oh, my great uncle was the head rabbi in a very important yeshiva or this or that or the other thing. So she says, what is, what, 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 what's her yichas? What's her credentials? He says, she is a loyal member of the Komsomol, the, the, the Communist Youth League. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And she says, yeah, but who's going to preside over the wedding? Now, in the original Mayaka, one of the variants, he's going to, oh, I'm going to get the chief rabbi of, uh, of a bigger city. To, he says, and it, it's painful, to, of course, to hear this now, but it, uh, this is already in the late 20s so, uh, or even 30s because he says, Stalin and Trotsky. So it had to be a narrow frame there because it's Stalin before, <laughs> before Trotsky had to get out fast, and, although it was eventually, of course, murdered by Stalin. Uh, Stalin and Trotsky were. So he says, okay, this is good. Now that is a parody because it's also about values in this case, Jewish values, which become, which become the same as uh, the uh, Soviet values, uh, but they're different. Now that's a parody song. Now you could take that, I think it's already been done, but we, 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 could, we could at a party uh, say, let's make up an, a, a parody of that about, uh, could be positive or negative. Uh, it could be, of course it could be in uh, what used to be called Palestine, uh, under the British mandate, on the Zionists building the rebuilding, resettling the land, and uh, 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 you could see where the values would be a similar thing. Uh, we, we could pick who who will be the uh, who will bless the wedding. Well, uh, uh, Herzl or Ben Gurion or whatever, and who will listen? Uh, now, uh, and what, what were the values? Well, obviously the kibbutz values would be non-materialistic. So we say, what are the value? Well, her credentials are that she knows how to plant or how to milk cows. And I'm making this up as I'm going along. Uh, I think there probably are some parodies like that. We could make up a parody uh, mocking uh, certain materialistic values in the United States. We say, who's gonna bless it? And say, oh, a certain hedge fund president or something, uh, whatever it is. There are many, many, and an unlimited number of parodies. Um, and uh, it doesn't always mean that they're humorous or even positive. So for example, let's take the song, Rojan Kiss Mit Mandan, because we, it gives us many things to talk about that pertain to the four concerts of the festival. So when my grandmother sang Rojan Kiss Mit Mandan as a lullaby, I'm pretty sure it was just the first part. And we would ask her, and she came from a, a good sized city in Belarus called Gomel. In some dialects, Homel. It's spelled with a G. In other words. And uh, she would say it's a, Russian, a folk song, a Yiddish folk song. She had no idea that it was a song in a show, one of the two uh, hit songs, if you will, from a musical, what, what he called an operetta, Shulamis, by the composer who is credited as, quote, the father of, 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 uh, of Yiddish theater, uh, Avram Goldfaden. Um, so typically, in 
each act there is one main song. I, I don't remember how many songs are in the operetta. You might know whether it's probably 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, I don't remember. Uh, but the, the two most famous that lived beyond the operetta itself were Shabbos Yomtov from Rosh Chodesh and uh, Rajan Kismet Mountain, Raisins and Almonds. But it became folklorized. And my grandmother knew it because it's folklorized. And actually, Goldfaden pieced it together from certain already folk elements anyway. I mean, there are, there's a lot not known about it. But one thing for sure is, what is the song about? He's rocking a baby to sleep. In this case, it's a, it's a baby boy, Yankala, in the cradle. And under the cradle is a, a little white goat. And where is the father? The father is out of the town. He's off selling, trading in raisins and almonds. Presumably to make a living. Parnosa, making a living for the family. So he's not here. He's a... Believe it or not, there is more than one three or four hundred page doctoral dissertation on what that goat means. Not just in that song, throughout Jewish history. I, I mean, I have one of them by an Israeli scholar sitting on my desk. It, it, so you have the whole image, value image of what the goat means and what does the parent want of the child? The parent wants the child to grow up to be learned. And in order to grow up to be learned, the father has to earn a living for the family. But that's the value there. However, it, it was a song with a girl instead of a boy as known throughout the Russian Empire as Unter Sorolus Vigla, under little, little Sarah's cradle. And that's how it was um, first published as a folk song with, a, uh, with, with an appropriate accompaniment by the Society for Jewish Folk Music, Gesellschaft für Jewish Volksmusik in St. Petersburg, I think around 19, I think it was very early on in 1909 because they officially chartered in 1908 and uh, by Lazar Saminsky. And then many other people took the same song, the same tune, the same words, sometimes a variant as it was discovered being sung as a folk song throughout the empire and, and made uh, different settings of it. So in either case, it got folklorized, that's for sure. Uh, however, in, uh, during, the, during the war, during the Shoah, there were parodies of it in a very sad sense. And I've mentioned this just to point out that parody does not mean ipso facto funny or humorous or, or even uh, clever or positive. It can mean the opposite. But the same situation is transferred. In the case, for example, of the, uh, the, the Kovno ghetto, that the Germans built as a way station uh, for transit to death camps. Um, they, they made up a parody of Russian Kismet Mandan, which uh, has to do with another important Jewish value, memory, remembering. And in this parody, it says, we have basically, I mean, I'm paraphrasing the parody, but, we are going, we are not going to live, but may just one of us live just so he can tell the world what happened. And that is a parody to the Russian Kismet Mandolin, to the same tune. Uh, there were others. I think Gila Flam quotes at least one in her book on the Lodge Ghetto, but that was a long time ago that I read that. So the whole parody genre is very interesting. Uh, another type uh, was a song, um, also a Goldfaden song that became folklorized, Verjammert Verklokt, in grief and in despair. Um, it's from a, a less known uh, operetta or show of his. Uh, and um, certain poets wrote new words to it as the tune became, uh, 
and one of the one of them was kind of clever, uh, a very famous poet who who wrote probably words and uh, to him, we're not sure to another one of the songs on the program, Morris Rosenfeld, who's called the poet of the sweatshop in America when he, when he came to America, uh, because many 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 of his poems were about the harshness of immigrant life, uh, but not all harshness. I mean, uh, I mean, the romanticization of the harshness for these silly thirteen series uh, uh, documentaries is is also very annoying. Uh, the romanticization of, 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 of rampant socialism and, and so forth. That was very small part. The majority of immigrants, no matter how bad, how harsh life was, it was better than it was in Europe. Very few went back. The few who went back, went back because they couldn't observe Shabbos here. Uh, and uh, they, they knew that at least their children might be able to own their own business. And under communism, you can't own your own business. Uh, but the, the, the general mood got captured by poets such as Rosenfeld, by some poets who were much to, further to the left than Rosenfeld, such as uh, Rheingold and Finchevsky. But Rosenfeld took that uh, song, which the people already knew the melody, but they didn't know the show anymore, of, of, of Goldfaden, Fagermert Verklok, and wrote a poem about Castle Garden. Now, Castle Garden was the immigrant uh, landing station out in the harbor before um, before the, the current one that we have Ellis the museum. Huh? Ellis Island. El yeah, Ellis Island. But it's a museum now. Before that was even built, was Castle Garden. And it used to be, if you go three, four generations ago, that used to be a common Yiddish expression among Americans in a kind of gentle, negative but gentle way about a, a scene of commotion or someone's house. You know, I don't like to go to someone's house on, on, on Saturday night. It's a castle gardens over there. It's a castle garden. And then it's a hoo it's a menagerie. It's a commotion. Well, castle gardens, uh, I don't remember if the, if the structure still stands out in the, in the harbor. Uh, but anyway, that was preceded Ellis Island. So he wrote a poem about the commotion of uh, immigration and coming in and what it's like. Also, some of the strophes are uh, referring to uh, people who weren't let in, usually because of a medical condition. The most common, one of the most common ones was uh, was uh, an eye an eye disease. That people were there. Um, some were held up at Ellis Island later on when Ellis Island had dormitories for that. Um, some were sent back. There's even a Yiddish song uh, saying that the, referring to it, uh, that the uh, hand being held up by, the, by Lady Liberty is a hand saying, halt, stop, you can't come in here, because specifically because of that eye ailment, uh, which other countries accepting Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe weren't so concerned about. Uh, whether it was Cuba or South America, or uh, uh, especially when, if it was from Lithuania, uh, South Africa, and so forth. Uh, and that is one of many reasons uh, that uh, these folk songs were uh, parodied into things that would resonate, like Castle Garden, that resonated with people. The original words, which were actually about grief and despair, and the original words are really a very, a very sad song, because the original words has have to do with why Jews are never allowed to stay any in any one country for very long uh, and uh, uh, in in the song uh, there's a prayer that some nation will someday let us call it our home kind of shades of political Zionism but not quite in there so uh, in the parody uh, it's about America which, uh, one could still be told, no, you can't come in here. I mean, the, there is only one place uh, from which no Jew can ever, ever again be turned away, and that is the desk at Ben Gurion Airport, which I consider, therefore, the holiest, even more holy than the Kotel, than the wall, uh, the holiest place uh, in Israel, because it is the one place in the world 
from which, even in theory, no Jew can ever be turned away. Um, but at that time, it was Castle Garden that had that image, at least for the majority of Jews. And so it became a parody. Uh, another song, Schluff Mein Kind, very famous song people just sing, it's a lullaby. Schluff Mein Kind, and it says, your father is away in America. Very common. That teaches us something. It's exactly with my paternal grandparents. They couldn't afford to come with even with one child. So the father would come first. Most of the time, not always, would save, work hard, save up enough money, and then send for his wife and if, if there were any children, which is exactly what happened in my grandparents' case. But this was very common. And I send them steamship tickets and so forth. I'm not going to deny what everybody knows that there were agencies set up to find husbands that didn't send for the wife and and so forth. But uh, the majority, of course, did. So the song is taught. Don't worry, young child in the cradle. Tat is in America. Father's in America, and then those he'll send for us soon. Well. There were parodies of that song uh, later in the Soviet Union, which weren't weren't so uh, so happy. And one of them is, "Your father is taught is in Siberia, in the Gulag." Wow, I've I've never heard that one. Yeah, and so forth and so on. I think you know the whole uh, the whole subject of of uh, Yiddish parody song. I mean, I'll just go into one more. I think my one of my favorite songs, which I actually did. Um, at a concert uh, in London at the Royal Festival Hall in 1990. But I don't know how many people got it. I think I, I'm, I mean, there were some laughs. Uh, but there was a, a very famous uh, Yiddish folk song called Vos wird sein as Mashiach wird kommen. What will happen when the Messiah comes? Now, okay, that is a secular folk song, but it's it has two levels of understanding. First of all, that's a common aspect of Judaism, that the Mashiach will come, the Messiah will come. Okay. Uh, in uh, Maimonides' 13 principles, it's not a hope, it's a fact. Ani ma'amin, I believe with perfect faith that, it, that the Messiah will come. Uh, you have the adverts in the subways of, I don't know, 25 years ago, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe had decided that the, that the Messiah is not only coming, he's already left and he's on his way. Now stop for a moment and think about what that means. <laughs> he's already left and he's on his way. From where? How fast is he moving? How fast? Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it is a, 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 an attitude that is ingrained in one way or another, whatever it means. However, this song is also part of a category of songs, a huge category, mocking Hasidim by non-Hasidim. Because in, uh, as it says in this song, the Rebbe tells us the answers to everything. The Rebbe knows whether he is an orde a rabbi or not, because some rabbis were rabbis and some were not. In other words, qualified to determine uh, Jewish law, or what we would say ordained today. Or whatever it is, the charismatic leader, the masters. Uh, so this song is also a dialogue song. So in the song, and I, I, I don't remember, it might have even been on Theodor Berkel's first, that's how famous it was, first uh, Yiddish folk song album. And the answer is, we'll have a feast. Now it's not clear whether we'll have a sudden you, a feast. It's not clear whether the feast will be in the world to come, or if the Messiah will wake up the dead and it'll be here. I mean, that's a whole other story. But in the Messianic era, it's a world is perfection. Okay. What will we eat at the feast? Answer, the Rebbe says, or the Rebbe knows everything. We will eat the Leviathan in the Bible, the Leviathan. You know, now we will eat the Leviathan. It's Which is a wonder, that comes from a wonderful Talmudic story. Probably. Yeah. Probably. For, uh, uh, in fact, I think it does. Uh, and now that you mention it, because then it also says we'll eat the wild ox, the Leviathan, Leviathan. Okay, 
then it says, okay, now at every feast, somebody gives a Devar Torah, words of wisdom, because it is said that when three men, three or more men uh, in, in, in the Talmud uh, dine, have a meal. And what is a meal? A meal is if, if, if bread is, <laughs> is broken first, if you make a motzi. Uh, then there must be words of Torah, otherwise the meal is, is a sacrilege. So somebody must, must give a little drush, a little sermonette, a little something, words of wisdom of Torah. So I said, who will give the words of Torah? So the answer, well, obvious, Moses. Moses, our teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's the it's Messianic era. Well, who, who's going to entertain? Who's going to dance for us? Obvious, Moses' sister, Miriam, because in the, in the Torah, Miriam is a dancer. And uh, so forth and so on. Probably the most famous, I don't know, but the, the funniest, uh, most interesting parody of that song, again, is a mockery, but it's a mockery of the Soviet Union. So somebody asks, what will happen? So what is the theme? Because we said before that uh, songs like Mayerka have a theme of Jewish values. This has a theme of utopianism. Well, there are different views of utopianism. They're all dangerous if carried uh, to, to the fullest extent. So what will happen when the Messiah comes? In this case, the answer is we'll have a Sovdepenu, that means a, a Soviet council. Uh, well, and, we're, and we'll, we'll drink and eat there. Well, what are we going to eat? We'll eat our bread kartlech, our bread ration cards, because this is you know, at the time everyone had ration cards. Now it's a utopia. We don't. We can eat our bread, our ration cards. Now, who will be? Who's going to give the Devar Torah? And it says the Devar Torah, the words of wisdom. And the answer: Lenin Rabenu. Lenin, our teacher, our rabbi, our teacher. It says, who will say the brachas? The the the. the the benedictions, if you want, in English, there's no real word for brachas. Who will say the brachot, the hamotzi? And the answer, Trotsky Hagibor, Trotsky the hero. And that it gets very involved. It says, who will dance for us? Well, then you have to know a little Soviet history and not many people are gonna catch this. And I, don't, I mean, it's not to be expected. It's Lunacharsky, Lunacharsky. Well, Lunacharsky was the first minister of Soviet culture in the, in, in the Narcom process, and so, and so on and so forth. That, that, that's the, that is the parody there. Uh, and of course, you could have a parody of that song in, uh, uh, in what is now the state of Israel and what was uh, mandatory Palestine or even uh, Palestine before under the Turks or whatever. In other words, having to do with the Zionist movement, uh, you could have it in any, any form of that approached a time that will be better, uh, 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 let alone a, a moving towards a utopianism. So those are all, uh, now I don't claim to know uh, about the parody genre in especially non-Western cultures, because I know nothing of uh, 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 Japanese folk song, uh, Chinese folk song, and so forth, except that it exists. Um, I have a feeling I could vaguely recall parodies uh, in English folk songs, in Scottish folk songs, just as we could recall uh, 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 the, the notion of, of adding strophes for fun. I mean, even going back to that notion, I mean, even at, at, at parties, at games, um, around the table, uh, extemporizing. Um, Used to be a song that children sang at summer camps and on buses to alleviate the boredom called We Can't Get to Heaven on Something on Something. I don't know if you ever heard that. But we, we can't get to heaven on Alex, we can't get to heaven on Alex's car. And then you'd wait for somebody to say something that rhymes with it. And somebody would yell out, because the gosh darn thing can't go that far. And then they'd point to another child, say, and then people would raise their hands and say, Oh, I, I can think of one. 
And so what they were doing is adding variant strophes right away. I can't get to heaven on roller skates because whoever's on ice, the skates he hates, I don't know, something like that. And, and, and we go on and on. So uh, uh, some of this is, is uh, common to folk song in general, uh, but the parody genre, uh, I really know about mostly as a, um, a property of, of Yiddish folk song. And uh, I encourage people to find new parodies uh, that when I say not new parodies, to find parodies that are new to us uh, uh, that existed in, in different uh, contexts. Um, and they could be private contexts. They don't have to be uh, public forums and so forth. Um, what else can we say about Yiddish folk song? There's probably no subject, uh, no legitimate subject that, it, that doesn't come under the umbrella of Yiddish folk song, of secular folk song, whether it's love, courtship, marriage, grief. Uh, conscription songs were a big thing, but they were a big thing, not just in Jewish folk song, but in Russian folk song. In other words, the, the uh, well, actually, well, we'll talk about this when we talk about the Prokofiev. I mean, well, the, taking leave of, uh, a woman taking leave of her husband as he goes off to serve his time in the army. Um, it's not peculiar uh, to Jewish folk song, but um, there is a, an entire category of such songs, some of them which were turned into quasi-art songs also. Um, there are festive songs, songs that people would sing particularly at weddings, which in Eastern Europe was the primary uh, festive occasion on, outside of liturgical occasions, outside of our holiday occasions. Um, and, and then we get to uh, the use of Yiddish folk song, which we'll talk about next. Wonderful. That's a great place to pause. Yeah. Neil, thank you so much.